All right, we're back for another show, and today I've got Gabby Rowe, who is the uh, owner of Maestro Sports and Entertainment. Um, how's it going, Gabby? Great. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for joining me. Can't wait to to learn more about uh, all your adventures in uh, the niche sports world. Um, looks very exciting, and I'm sure we've probably um, – have got some mutual connections, I'm sure, along the way, um, both being in that kind of field. But walk us through kind of your background, you know, how you got started all the way up to where you're at now. Yeah. Uh, well, like many good things in life, I, it got started by accident for the most part. I was uh, uh, living in Southern California after graduating from college, and a friend of mine called me and said that he was wanted to write a business plan for um, a, a sports idea. Um, so I was working with him on the side on that. Um, and during that process, we actually were looking at a, at a soccer company in Brazil. So we went down to Brazil. Um, and while we were there on a completely separate set of business, we saw a bunch of people out there playing soccer on the beach, barefoot, full 11 on 11 soccer games. And these guys were really good at this unique version of the sport and having and being living in Southern California where beach volleyball was so popular. Um, I was like, huh, maybe there's something here. If we could take this world's most popular sport of soccer that has this Brazilian authenticity and kind of package it into kind of a sexy sport like beach volleyball has become and kind of give it what we call California color, we might be onto something. So on kind of the plane ride home on the back of a nap and we kind of drafted up maybe a, a beach soccer business plan of sorts. And then we were fortunate enough to be able to kind of shift some of our focus to that. And it started to get some legs. So we created beach soccer company um, and more or less built the sport of beach soccer from scratch. This is two guys that are all of 22, 23 years old at the time. Um, and that's what got me into this emerging or high growth sports business was almost just looking out our hotel window and seeing people playing soccer on the beach. And actually my business partner, he actually went, would go down and play with these guys. And he <laughs> knew some, some of them were like world cup stars from Brazil that were kind of organizing these pickup games. So he started a dialogue with them and then it just started, it launched, it launched on from there. And it's been, uh, you know, that was an eight year, an eight year endeavor of making a ton of mistakes learning as we, we were building the plane as we were flying it, learning as we go, made a lot of mistakes along the way, overpaid for you know, a number of things we didn't need to, um, didn't really you know, trademark as well as we probably should have, but learned so much in that eight year period. Um, and then that sport actually, um, if you just fast forward, we ended up selling the business to Octagon eight years later um, and at the same time negotiating a deal with FIFA. So it became an official FIFA sanctioned sport. Um, and now from what I hear, and we're back involved actually in a new aspect of it, but now it's a, it's a billion dollar global business. There's been seven beach soccer FIFA World Cups. Um, it's a fully sanctioned and homologated sport under the FIFA umbrella, um, as well as having tons and tons of offshoots from it. So, you know, back of a napkin on an airplane, you know, 30 years later, it's a billion dollar business. So it shows what can happen within this, you know, crazy it's, area of these high growth sports properties. It's, to, it is totally crazy. Um, just, but you see a lot of great ideas, you know, come that same way. You know what? Yeah. It was, you know, something triggered something. Let's, uh, yeah. let's put it. I mean, I, I need to have napkins around me, I think, because uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to miss another good one. Yeah. But with, with soccer, I was involved in indoor soccer. Okay. And so a lot of, those guys um, do play beach soccer. Yep. And yep. I think, I don't know if the national team trains in San Diego, but we had a team out in San Diego as well. And I know that a lot of their guys are involved in that, but yep. um, I've seen it grow. And especially like you said, the Brazilians, mm -hmm. you know, for, for indoor soccer, we get a ton of Brazilians, you know, a lot of good futsal players yep. and um, they translate real well. So um, yeah, I've, I've seen, just from the short time I've been involved in indoor soccer, probably eight years, um, yeah. I've seen I've seen a lot of the beach soccer. So yeah, the skill set of the players is very similar. Um, just kind of tight spaces, um, you know, lots of touches on the ball. 
Uh, the really unique part of it is, is you can't really pass the ball over the sand. You have to do it in the air. So the aerial side of the sport became oh, yeah. really key. And, and we also, we, we specifically created the sport. It was no longer 11 on 11 on a, you know, a hundred yard field. We made it a 30 by 40 yard field, um, you know, four field players and a goalie per side. And it was basically designed to fit within a television screen. So nice. a camera can be sitting there at midfield on the normal aperture and get the entire field. And obviously you're going to be moving around and zooming in, but that was the idea is that it fit perfectly. So it was created for television. The games last exactly 48 minutes, which is TV time. And then you add your commercials Commercial, to it. Yeah. So it was designed to fit into an hour of TV per game. So we did a lot of smart things along the way as well. That being one of them. Did um, you do um, like a league or was it just exhibitions? How, how was it kind of structured that way? Actually, good question. And that actually parlays into uh, what we're doing now. Uh, when we started it, and really up until about two years ago, the whole entire competitive landscape at the professional level was nation versus nation. So it was always Brazil, Germany, Spain, France, Japan, USA, etc., playing as national teams. In the beginning, they were made up national teams. It wasn't part of the U.S. team is not part of U.S. soccer. Now it's fully homologated and part of the FIFA system. Um, but it was always nation versus nation. And obviously, we had great rivalries that were already there when Argentina plays against Brazil or when Germany plays against England or Italy plays against France. And there was just great rivalries. And we had World Cup stars representing their countries on the beach. So it all worked out. However, um, there are some limitations to having nation versus nation competitions from a business perspective as well. Take the United States as an example. Um, as you can imagine, um, when the list of priorities for U.S. soccer, men's team, <laughs> women's team, right. you keep on going down the line, any time spent on beach soccer is probably not going to be looked on too fondly within the world of U.S. soccer because they just have bigger fish to fry. Um, so that's limiting to the, to the, to the, that's providing a ceiling to how, how high beach soccer can grow as a national team sport in this country. And that was similar, similar issues in some other countries. So over the last two years, uh, I am back in business with beach soccer worldwide is the name of the company that runs it based out of Barcelona, Spain. And my good friend, Juan Cusco, who runs that. Um, and Juan and I have formed reformed a partnership. Um, and uh, we are now entering into a whole new world. We've convinced now 20 of the major soccer clubs in the world, FC Barcelona, Arsenal, Vasco da Gama, Corinthians, nice. uh, AC Milan, et cetera, to support beach soccer teams. So we are now helping them create a Barcelona beach soccer team and an Arsenal beach soccer team just like they have their men's team and in some cases their women's team and their, their youth team. Now they're going to have a beach soccer team. And in 2021, near the end, and all of 2022, we are launching a global world club league where all of those major clubs are going to play against each other in a league format of beach soccer. So nice. it's going to be great to have some of the world's most popular brands in sports, literally world's biggest brands in sports, played against each other. It's Champions League-esque, although that's obviously UEFA, that's structured within Europe. It's a global Champions League of beach soccer featuring some of the top clubs in the world. So we are back in it and very excited. So now we went from nation versus nation, which still exists and it's still gonna be ongoing, right. uh, and the club. So the whole club versus country is going to be in beach soccer as well, but we're very excited. In fact, I've rarely been as excited about any high growth sports property than this new offshoot of beach soccer on the club's world tour side, it's going to be amazing. What kind, what's your role going to be in that? Are well, you just we a partner? Are, yeah, we are a partner in the business, um, and we are helping find the uh, kind of the logistical and operational side of it, primarily in finding the locations to host the events themselves, uh, and as always, very involved on the sponsorship and television side. Gotcha. So what did you get into after, you know, you sold Beach yeah. – Beach soccer to Octagon. Okay. What what was kind of next for you then? Well, I'm I'm so I actually I bought my partner out two years before before we sold it to Octagon. I'm 20, 
probably 27, 28 years old. And I thought it'd be a great idea to buy my partner out and move the whole company to Europe. Um, Cause I had so much experience at 27 years old. Uh, looking <laughs> back on it, it was an insane decision. Um, but as my father told me at the time, he was kind of my business advisor as a kid in his twenties. He's like, you got nothing to lose, go for it. And I'm like, yeah, he's like, no, seriously, you have nothing. You have no money, you have no wife, you have no house, you have no anything. You can't be any worse than you are right now. It can only get better from here. And I was like, well, that's kind of depressing, but it's also kind of true and somewhat right. oddly motivating. So I'm like, yeah, screw it, let's give it a shot. So, cause the real, the real money in the business was in Europe. It's a Brazilian South American sport given California or American color, but really the market was in Europe because that's where the economy was really there to support it. And the rivalries of, like I mentioned before, Spain and Germany and France and England playing against each other was brilliant and plenty of beaches. So, um, and Barcelona is now the headquarters of it, but I moved it to Monte Carlo. I had some relationships and connections there and moved it to Monaco. Um, and that's when we then sold the business. Uh, and I'm in my office in Monaco and I get a voicemail from someone claiming to be body by Jake, Jake Steinfeld saying, yo, Gab, I got a business opportunity for you in lacrosse. <laughs> and I'm like thinking it's one of my friends uh, playing a joke on me, but I call the number back and it's actually Jake Steinfeld of body by Jake, who had an idea to start a professional lacrosse league. So I played lacrosse growing up. I played lacrosse in college at University of Virginia. I played in the indoor professional league for four years for the Philadelphia Wings. So I had a nice. lacrosse playing background and yeah. a sport development background now with beach soccer. So Jay called me and said, I wanna start a professional outdoor lacrosse league. Uh, why don't you move back to the States and we'll do this. And I said, okay, I had sold the business. I spent the summer enjoying myself and then came back this is in, God, 1999, maybe. Um, yeah, it's 1999 that we did this. So I moved back to uh, New York City um, and started Major League Lacrosse and wrote the business plan with a bunch of founding partners, including Jake Steinfeld and Dave Morrow and others from Warrior Lacrosse. Uh, and then we launched Major League Lacrosse. So that was my next high growth sports venture, which was like Beach Soccer, a complete startup from scratch. One of my partners, I think, was involved in Rochester, um, Chris Economides back sure. then. Um, yeah. I think they had a couple, they had a couple teams up there, but uh, I was yeah, briefly Frank a partner Ross, with him in soccer down there. Guys. Yeah, the Rochester yeah. Rattlers, they became. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, yeah, we played in the same place that their soccer team was playing, which was the minor yep. league baseball stand that we would convert for lacrosse and soccer. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were a great owner operator of ours up there in Rochester. Yeah, I remember all those. Uh, they're, they're t they told me about Jake. That's why when you said that, I was like, oh, the, I, I can't remember. Was he a partner in the teams as well or just the league? Just the league. Okay. Yeah, he yeah. was the founder of the league. Yeah. Uh, when you win the Major League Lacrosse Championship, you win the Steinfeld Cup. So he's still involved in that way. I spoke to Jake last night, actually. We're oh, still friends with each other. We're working on a potential project together. I spoke to him last night. He's exactly the same. He's got more energy than any human being in the world um, <laughs> and more enthusiasm. And he's so infectious. He's a great, uh, he's a great promoter. Um, and, you know, he did a lot for the sport of lacrosse um, just by having the passion and the commitment that he had to it uh, to get professional outdoor lacrosse to where it is today. Now there's two leagues, which is interesting. Um, yeah. so it's, uh, it's been a, it's like all these sports that I work with a wild ride to get to where we are today, but it's still fun to have, you know, to see something that you started years ago, still continuing and providing opportunities for players and for fans and for brands. Yeah, that, no, that is very rewarding. What would you say is like the hardest aspect of, you know, launching that or the beach soccer? Like what, you know, what were you not expecting that, uh, was like a big eye opener for you. I mean, you know, one of my favorite expressions is it's, it's, it's not the, about the money. It's about the money <laughs> because it's always there. It's always right. an element of this and for the good of the game, for the love yeah. of the sport, all of that is there and right. it's true. And without that love of the game or love of creating something new without that passion, you're dead. If you're in it only for the money, you've got a problem. If you're in it only for the good of the game and the sport, you're also going to have a money problem at some point. Right. 
So um, navigating those two, the hardest part has really been navigating those two, making decisions that are good for the sport, but also good for the business. And sometimes they clash with each other. Uh, and sometimes they're in perfect alignment, trying to find that alignment of kind of art and commerce, so to speak, where the business from a financial standpoint and the business from a artistic or sports standpoint are sympathetic with each other. That's really the hardest part is finding when those two come together. Um, and there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle too, that you have to put together in order to become successful or at least just sustainable. Um, and probably the hardest part is finding the marriage between art and commerce, the marriage between the sport and the business side and making sure they match up with each other. And if they're not there, you have to revamp your plan. Um, that's one of, and, and lots of times, you know, it comes down to the partners that you bring in. Sometimes you bring in a financial partner who has no operational or sport experience. Sometimes you can bring in a sport partner who's got no uh, money to really help you out. And to me, that's me. yeah, and, and those are difficult, right? Yeah. Because if you really need both, and you, yeah, either you do need having, that combination. You need the 100%. combination. That's the hardest part is finding the correct combination of those two. Yeah, that's what I struggled with when I was a, a league administrator in indoor football and uh, some other sports. It's like, yeah, how do you how do you find that that mix? Because typically the the money people aren't in the sports operation side of things right. and and don't know how to operate that type of business. So it, it was always a struggle I had. Yeah, but uh, like, like, like any sport, Andrew, or any business, really, you know, it takes four things to be successful. You got to be smart. You got to be hardworking. You got to have people skills and you got to care. I mean, that, yeah. those are the attributes that the people have to have. And if you have money, you can get to where you're going a lot faster. That's really the, the, the key to it all is being smart, being hardworking, having people skills and really caring, having passion for what you do. And like I said, if you have money, you can get there faster. You can get there slowly um, without yeah. the money, um, yeah. but you might run out of even the small amount of money you have, or it might take so long that you just can't, it's just not sustainable. Yeah. Um, so money isn't to be overlooked, but also not underlooked. Have you just spent your time on the league side of things or were you involved on the team side as well? Well, uh, the key to every successful league is having strong teams. So uh, I think Adam Silver was one of the first people, I'm sorry, David Stern was one of the first people to recognize this when he created Teambo within the NBA, yep. um, that you can't just have a league and a bunch of satellite teams that are all doing their own thing. Each team has to make every other team stronger and every other team has to make each team stronger because that rising tide is gonna float all the boats higher. Um, and I had a surreal discussion at a Anheuser-Busch um, holiday party at the Cohiba Club in New York City, right when we were starting Major League Lacrosse and Anheuser-Busch was one of our partners. So I'm invited to this, partner, this party and it's Gary Bettman, uh, Paul Tagliabu and Don Garber wow. and David Stern were all at this party. And it was actually two separate conversations, but in essence, what all of them said to me at that time is, hey, good luck, kid. And by the way, make sure you have strong owners of your teams. That's gonna be the future of your league. And we were at the beginning stages and I'm still in my 20s and I'm like, okay, you guys obviously <laughs> done really well, but you know, there's a lot of other things that are important to getting the best players, getting your sponsors, getting the TV, uh -huh. getting the venues. They're like, uh-huh, all that is secondary. <laughs> really good, trustworthy, smart, and financially sound owners is going to be the backbone of this league. And they were right. We learned the hard way as we got into it um, that your the leagues in some cases are only as strong as their weakest link. So you got to make sure that all of your links are strong. Um, and whether that is event owner operators or tournament directors or any part that you have that's on the front lines of if you're a league or a tour and you have teams and you have an events, they've got to be really strong. So while I have never personally been an owner operator of a team in a league, um, I feel like I have because I'm living and breathing their life every day because the combination of all of them is really the sum of the parts is what the league is going to be able to achieve. So understanding and really curating their success has been a big part of what I've always done. So when you got through, you know, launching that, 
you know, you weren't done though, were you? I mean, no, <laughs> it doesn't I, look I, I like got, So back to Adam Silver for a second, actually. Adam Silver, he probably doesn't even know this. Um, he and I were having a discussion about the, um, what is now the G League, which was then the Development League, which was then, and it's probably now 2002, was an idea. Um, and he was having a discussion with like, hey, was this the kind of thing that you would potentially have an interest in working with? Uh, and I was like, sure. Um, and then uh, he's like, well, I know this is kind of awkward because I'm talking to you about a job potentially with, with us, but um, I have a friend who has just rolled together the sport of beach volleyball, took the women's tour and the men's tour and bought both of them, rolled them together. Um, and he's looking to build that with your beach experience. Maybe that's something you'd be interested in. Adam Silver introduced me to a guy by the name of Leonard Armato who was at the time rolling together beach volleyball. Um, Leonard and I got to know each other and Leonard said, hey, why don't you come on out here? And I became the general manager of the AVP Pro Beach Volleyball Tour, uh, working alongside of Leonard Armato and Bruce Binko and Andy Reith, who were the partners at the time. And we kind of relaunched the sport of beach volleyball with the men's and women's tour for the first time together and relaunched the AVP. Um, and that was when Sinjin Smith was our announcer. Karch Karai was just starting to finish playing but we had Misty May and Kerry Walsh that we really were able to have um, a great, for me personally, nine year run uh, with AVP Pro Beach Volleyball. Now that wasn't a startup, but it was a restart of, mm -hmm. you know, taking two sports or two men's and women's groups and putting them together. Um, and that was a lot of fun. We took that company public after about six years, which was interesting um, so to get that experience. Uh, so yeah, it was, I was back in California, in Southern California, Manhattan Beach, uh, helping to run the AVP Pro Beach Volleyball Tour, which again was kind of right up my alley at the time. Was that just on the West Coast or did you got, was that international or even yeah. on the East Coast but, at all? Well, we did, I think at our peak, 18 domestic events a year, um, which was crazy because they were over 22 weekends, kind of the warmer months of the year. So it was a, a lot of travel, as you can yeah. imagine. Uh, and then because we didn't have enough work to do, we started the hot winter nights tour. We did a 17 event indoor tour where we would go to in the dead of winter, Minneapolis, Chicago, and we would go to their major hockey arenas or basketball arenas, put sand in there, crank up the temperature and have a beach party in the middle of February in the middle of Minneapolis or Chicago or Milwaukee. It was awesome. So we had these indoor beach volleyball events taking over the winter time. And then we also thought it would be a good idea and it was to start AVP Australia. So um, we did a five event AVP Australia tour. So at the peak we had, I think 18 full four day domestic events, five four full day events in Australia and doing 17 one night winter indoor tour events. It was busy. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and those were all three separate legal entities. So we had different sponsors and different TV partners for, for all three of those different entities. So it was, it was super interesting. And, and I think one of the more, one of the more progressive things that we also did at AVP is we started our own internal activation services division. So if Crocs or Nissan or Sony or Cuervo were sponsoring AVP, we set up an activation services division so that we could actually help them activate on site at the events. And we already had 15, 18 wheelers going to every single event. Um, and we became an internal agency. So instead of them hiring GMR marketing or Vivid or Genesco, they would hire AVP activation services who was really good at coming up with ideas and ways in which their brand could integrate and reach the audience that AVP was, was reaching. Um, and we had an operational infrastructure already. So that became its own multi-million dollar subdivision of AVP, which also was activating the winter tour, which was also activating the Australian tour. Um, and that really kind of helped me morph into what we're doing for Maestro now on the brand side. Our brand business is very similar to that, where we are helping brands activate against the high growth sports marketplace. And that really started when we were at AVP and having all those multiple tours domestically and internationally. Is that where you went from AVP is to Maestro or? 
Yeah, there was a there was two year or two years I think in between with ASA Entertainment that was in the action sports space, a global action sports group, um, very similar to AVP except a lot more events and you know bigger, more events, most of them smaller in size and stature. But at that time, I was still kind of crafting the maestro idea. So how it all came about was the same guy that I was in Brazil, uh, putting the business plan on the back of the napkin. When we when I bought him out and then we end up selling the company to octagon he got out of sports and just was in the private equity business but was starting to circle back into sports and we've been friends since we were very young and we always said hey someday let's put the band back together so we started talking around this time about putting the band back together and we created the concept of maestro at that point in time which was a service provider to the high growth sports industry but in particular he also had owned and built a soccer facility in suburban Pennsylvania. He was one of the major owners of the Philadelphia Union soccer team. He had the idea to start an academic institution where kids would go to school all day long and also train in elite soccer environment. So we wanted to create that business as well. So he did and we did. Uh, that's what brought me back to suburban Philadelphia to create Maestro alongside of Richie Graham, my partner, who has sports businesses of his own that we are providing services to, and we provide services to third party sports businesses as well. So I'm back in business with my friend who we started Beach Soccer with. So that came full circle. It's um, awesome how that works out. To Philly, and that was, you know, eight years ago. And we've been running and gunning ever since then. Yeah, that's pretty cool to be able to do that, you know, after, you know, what, almost 20 years. Yeah. Or a we little over summer 20 camp years. When we, were, we met at summer camp when we were eight years old. Yeah. Yeah. And then stayed friendly, did beat soccer, went our separate ways and, and put the band back together uh, about eight years ago. And, and, you know, now we've been, you know, kicking ass with Maestro, which has been a lot of fun. It's great when you're working with people you like and, uh, you know, have that kind of uh, relationship with. Agreed. What do you, so kind of, what are all the services that you guys offer now with Maestro? Yeah. Well, um, it's all in kind of in the high growth sports space. First and foremost, we do property representation. We work with emerging sports properties. Um, so that's kind of the first major bucket. Currently, Major League Rugby, the American Ultimate Disc League, the International Axe Throwing Federation, Beach Soccer Worldwide with our clubs world tour. We're back in business with them. Um, the American Cornhole League, the UDEF Pro Breakdancing Tour, um, the World Cycling League and their new European Team Track League, which we're starting to put together for next year, uh, and USA Curling are our brand property clients. We are working with most of them on the sponsorship side, some of them on event operations, some of them on helping them become an Olympic sport, like we helped with although there are a lot of other people involved. We help break dancing, get into the Paris games, which is awesome. Um, some of them were just doing just their international expansion. Some are helping them with television. So there's different services that we provide to the sports properties. Um, and the second chunk is, is with brands and brands that are sponsoring either those sports properties or other sports properties. We have become, dare I say, experts in helping brands optimize their relationship with the high growth sports properties. So whether they sponsor UFC or curling or cornhole, we're starting to put together a much bigger division that is helping brands like Subway and Devour Foods and Tiger Bomb, three of our clients, helping them, Landshark Lager, another one, helping them activate and optimize their relationship with these high growth sports properties. Because no one's, there's agencies out that'll help you at the Olympic level or help you at the league level. Maybe a few that'll help you if you sponsor a local team, which is an area that we're probably going next, but almost no one really specializes in how to optimize these high growth sports properties that are out there. And there's hundreds of them. We happen to work with eight or nine of them and we have worked historically with about 15 of them, but there's hundreds of properties out there, all of which um, really need professional activation services and the brands don't have the bandwidth and or yeah. the expertise to do it, but we do. So how do you like identify those, you know, you, you know, you said there's hundreds of them out there. So how yeah. do you identify who to target or, yeah. I mean, are you just, 
are you at capacity now or, you know, are you looking to grow, um, you know, within that space still? It's a good question. Yes, definitely looking to grow within the space. Um, you know, we find ourselves at capacity and then we hire more people. And that's great. You know, it's a great problem yeah. to have is when you're, you're, you're hitting the ceiling, but you can just raise the ceiling. And uh, there's many, many experts within the business besides me, uh, which is great. I have a great staff that we've been able to build uh, who are extremely um, talented at what they do. Um, so that's been tremendous to have. And for the most part, for the most part, it's inbound calls. It's people either with ideas or with business that are saying, hey, we heard about Maestro and what you're doing with cornhole or curling or ax throwing or break dancing or ultimate, whatever it happens to be. And I mean, we probably have right now, I can look at my, my confidential list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, about 21, 22 different emerging high growth sports properties that we're currently having some levels of discussion about working with. Some of them are ideas. We are doing right now two, di three different business plans for ideas that are either brand new ideas or offshoots of something that exists and they're trying to build it. Like say the global beach soccer clubs tour would be an offshoot of beach soccer. There's a few of those that we're working on. And that our responsibilities is business plan writing. Um, once the business plan is done, potentially they hire us for the execution side of it as well. Not mandatory, but something they could, or that we would help them on certain elements of the execution. So in a lot of cases, they find us. Um, and some of them are sports that you have heard of before that are just looking to expand and grow. Uh, as I'm looking at my list, it's probably two thirds of them you've heard of the sport before and we're helping them with their growth strategy. As I like to say, one way of, of thinking of Maestro is we're the growth engine for high growth sports. Wherever they are on their trajectory, whether they're an idea and they're off the screen over here, or they're pretty mature, but they want to try and find the hockey stick um, as far as the growth is concerned. So about two thirds of these are sports you've heard of before. About a third of them are just brand new ideas. Um, but if you think about it, um, and this is, I was quoted the other day on this too, but you know, every sport was a crazy idea in the beginning, right? Yeah. I mean, like putting a ball into a peach basket, Right. I'm sure they're like, Naismith, you're nuts, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, but he's like, no, no, seriously. Or yeah. I don't know if he was the one who was doing that, but still, right. it's like every sport was a crazy ass idea at some point in time, yeah. right? All of them. I mean, I, 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 hockey, you know, is just there's all these sports are like, wait, on ice with a puck and a goal and a, and it's like, who's gonna ever want to watch that or do that? Well, obviously, it's done extremely well. So every sports was a crazy ass idea at one point in time. Um, and with the right people who are smart and hardworking enough people skills and who care and with the right management. And I like to say that over the eight years of creating beach soccer, we made so many mistakes. And if nothing else, our service to these sports is let's not make some of those mistakes. I don't know <laughs> the the learning that. curve. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very um, valuable. And, and where to focus your time and effort and money and how to get to where you want to get to faster and more efficiently is really where we um, where we sit. And when we talk to these sports properties, the initial discussions, we don't know where their needs are. Um, and when we have the discussions, it usually comes relatively obvious, like, look, you really need to get a better owner operator network, or you really need to get a your sponsorship situation in order. You really need a better media partnership because that's what's really holding you back. We can at a minimum find the gaps and then help them fill those gaps with the expertise that we have and the experience and relationships that we have. Um, and that's the real fun process. So like I said, I got 20 plus different sports that we're considering potentially working with. We'll probably only work with four or five of them, um, but still um, it's been fun to get to just see this, you know, eclectic group that we work with and all of them help each other. What we learn from ax throwing, we're throwing into break dancing. We exactly. learn to break dancing gets thrown into rugby. What we learn in rugby gets put into beach soccer. So all of them, you know, help each other because they're all smart people. It's a lot like when yeah. the different NBA teams started sharing all of their information, they all started to do better. We think of all of our properties that we work with as all of them are helping each other and vice versa, which has been a fun to be in the middle of all that. I mean, that's a, that's a huge advantage to going with an agency, you know, over just in-house. I mean, you get that many more perspectives and, 
and uh, you know market tests and and whatnot. Yep. And it's Have been, you? And it's, it's been oh, good go and bad. One one other point on that. It's been interesting when almost everyone that we work with is extremely passionate about their sport, and it's like their child, right? <laughs> and they can say, well, you know, maybe we need some help here. But it's, it's hard when someone else says, hey, maybe your child needs some help over here. It's like, hey, don't, you can't make fun of my kid. You can't criticize yeah. my kid. So we've become pretty good at finding ways to get our point across without insulting anyone. Uh, right. But it takes thick skin. And to be an entrepreneur, you got to have thick skin. And you got to, and thankfully, it's, these aren't our opinions. Usually when I say, hey, you really should consider X, Y, and Z, they might take offense. But then I back it up with here are nine other reasons. Here's nine examples as to why that became a problem for none of the sports properties that we've worked with or that we know of. And they say, oh, okay, um, we're trying to solve problems before they actually arise. Uh, but sometimes it takes some uh, a white glove technique that we have to utilize. Yeah. Because, Lead them to the water. Yeah, you know? the passion is there. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, uh, the passion can boil over into being um, stubbornness, which isn't good for business. Um, so that's another aspect that we have to kind of, you know, dance on some thin ice every now and again. Have you guys ever, or thought about, you know, like mainstream sports or has that never really been a consideration? Um, I mean, we're not against it. And, um, but also what gets me out of bed every morning is knowing that we're able to make a difference. Uh, and it would be outrageously arrogant for us to say, you know what? Goodell, give me a call because I've got all the answers. So you need <laughs> right. to take this NFL thing and, and really take it to the next level. Um, I just don't know how much of a difference we would really be able to make or any one person, any one sure. agency would be able to make with any of the more mature sports properties. Um, so it's just as more exciting for me every morning to be um, part of something where we can make a major difference. I mean, take the sport of breakdancing. That was an idea six years ago. Um, and in that five to six year time frame, it went from an idea to a tour to inclusion in the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. It's a full Olympic medal sport, which is just insane. That's amazing. Yeah. That it happens that fast. And there were many other people much, much more responsible for that than, than Maestro. And we played a little part. And that's yeah. really cool. And I'm telling you, when that Olympics is on and I am there in Paris watching it, it's going to be emotionally satisfying to be part of that. And even when, you know, I'm watching uh, television and back to back cornholes on, and next you have look, professional lacrosse is on, and then next you see, you know, a rugby game that's happening. You're like, well, that's kind of cool, right? I mean, that's, and if you don't love what you do and you don't have, get some personal satisfaction from it. Yeah. Um, and it's funny because we have, with our entire staff, they feel the same exact way. We're always texting each other like, hey, look at this. Isn't that cool? And you know, just when you see stuff that actually comes to fruition, um, it really does give personal satisfaction, which then again, gets you out of bed in the morning the next day to go and continue to do it again and again and again. And yep. it becomes fun and fulfilling. So are you guys working remotely now or are you usually yeah. wor working remotely? No, we're actually, and I, I, this is where I am the, uh, the old school guy uh, who's like, so the sports properties represent has to be willing to turn over a new leaf every now and again. <laughs> I'm, I was a very office bound type uh, uh, manager. Uh, I wanted people in the office every day and doing their thing. And the coronavirus forced us to break up that environment. And I was wrong. I'll admit it. Um, we are actually more efficient working remotely than we were working in an office. It also helped that I, I lived, of course, not of course, but I lived five minutes from the office, but the lion's share of the staff was 30 to an hour away, both ways. Mm -hmm. And for them, it was super inefficient. Um, anywhere from you know an hour and a half to two hours of their work day was spent in a car with limited efficiency. Um, now they're working the same exact hours, yet much, much more efficient from their home. But I got to tell you, technology played a major play in this. And I've always been an early adapter of technology, but was still a little hesitant for this whole work from home thing. But between Zoom and Slack in particular, 
those two have kind of, and, and Salesforce too, those three have really, and we were using them a little bit here and there, but they've become part of our daily lives. That's become part of the glue of our operational business infrastructure now. And I was in the, we, we took some meetings in our office um, each of the last couple of weeks. And that almost felt awkward. You know, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, let's all go home and get on Zoom. Let's just get on Zoom. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think we're, we're more efficient, um, which also really opens us up to being able to uh, get better talent to work with us too. Um, so uh, we were usually, and we're hiring some positions now, and we were traditionally restricted by, hey, who could be in suburban Philadelphia, right? Now it's like, yeah. it doesn't matter where you are, um, which gives us just a much, I mean, we've probably, I don't know, a thousand times more potential candidates could potentially work for us. A thousand times more better yeah. people could potentially be part of our staff. That's awesome. So efficiency and really optimizing the people that we have has um, been, a, I think, maybe the one, one of the only good things that come out of this coronavirus is the efficiency that we've developed and now we'll continue to work with in some form or fashion, at least with a blended model moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I think I was very similar with you. It's like, I always wanted staff in the office. I want to be able to see you. I, you know, I want you there, you know, eight to five, whatever. Um, and I never hosted a zoom call until this. I've been on a few, Yeah. but with, uh, I was working with uh, Washington nationals minor league sure. affiliate as their yeah. vice president of sales. And so I had a young sales staff. So it was concerning for me is, you know, having them work, from home because I was like, are they going to be able to do well? Yeah, we ended up getting a good system down. They they were killing it, so um, they they did a great job. But yeah, I think Zoom and like you said, Slack, some of these other technologies. I mean, it just makes it it's going to make it I think that much more efficient now. So yeah, and the other there another thing we've learned with the coronavirus is more about ourselves too and about our clients um, and. I've kind of coined the term that we, the high growth sports businesses live primarily in a sponsorship economy, as opposed to a ticket sales economy, which is where lots of the major sports live. Now, NFL is on a platform by itself with their television rights. But if you look at, I mean, minor league baseball, great yep. example, major league baseball, even some of the other soccer and basketball hockey leagues, where at least at the team standpoint, potentially more than the league, ticket sales are a major importance to their bottom line. Um, cornhole, break dancing, ax throwing, curling. We live in the televised sport sponsorship economy, yeah. not in the ticket sales economy. So thankfully for us, we have been able to weather the storm of the coronavirus because televised sports in a bubble or otherwise have continued to move on and ticket sales revenue is such a small portion of our revenue in any case. So um, we've been able to almost redefine our thinking about as we're developing these high growth sports to, well, first off, not be reliant, hopefully on any one revenue source at all, much less have that be ticket sales, especially now, but it's helped us kind of weather the storm uh, in that, um, if television broadcasts are still going on and sponsors are getting exposure to viewers who are potentially in a higher number because they're not having the other outdoor, you know, entertainment options or going to movies and things of that nature. So in some ways the coronavirus might actually be helping in this televised sports sponsored economy that we live in with the high growth sports properties that we work with. Oh, that's good. I saw, I mean, cause even recently I saw you guys did a partnership with major league rugby. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, things are still moving along. What, what does that all entail? What are you guys working on with them? For them, it is uh, multiple areas of just general advice and counsel that kind of just comes with the relationship that we have. But our biggest focus for them is helping them on the sponsorship side, structure and sales. Uh, they have a great television package. Um, the sport is booming in popularity in the United States. Uh, the quality of the product in the field is tremendous. They've never, they just got George Killebrew just took over as the commissioner. I saw that. Uh, 
he's done a great job of kind of getting them structured and getting the teams put in place. Um, and so we are now handling primarily national sponsorships for the league is really our focus for them. And with the television package that they have and the demographic that they reach and the, the resurgence or not the, or the, the, the surging popularity of the sport, um, we're off to a hell of a good start, which has been great. There's been a lot of initial interest, even though we've been at it for a couple of weeks now only. Uh, we're feeling pretty confident about that sports property's ability to deliver. Um, and from a timing standpoint, it's all 2021. Uh, they don't even, they'll have nothing until February of 2021. Um, brands are still, the smart ones in my mind, are still making plans now for the 2021 season to happen. Um, there's been limited, um, you know, limited trepidation about that, especially on the professional side college. I might be a little more nervous about it if I'm looking at spring sports, uh, but not the case for professional sports. I think that, you know, we're learning from what NBA, NHL, and, um, you know, MLS are going through right now with their, an MLB, with their bubble slash quasi local bubbles, whatever it might be. Um, I'm thinking by 2021, even if the vaccine has not arrived yet, that the professional sports will figure it out their bubble, quasi bubble model so that those sports can go on and at a minimum be televised TV, and sponsored yeah. and hopefully also have on-site attendance. Yeah. What is kind of, you know, the next five years look like for Maestro? Yeah. What are you, what are you thinking? Well, I think that, um, you know, the, the big opportunity for us is just continuing and we're dabbling in it, but continuing to grow outside of the United States. Um, we are, uh, you know, if you look at our clients, probably 80% of them are focused primarily domestically, but America is only 5% of the world's population. 95% of the value is outside of our borders. But Americans, as a general rule, think pretty much about America first and foremost and almost exclusively in some cases. Um, but all of these high growth sports properties have global growth possibilities. And I have found with beach soccer that an Americanized sport and America, just like just basically entertainment content in general, whether that's Baywatch or any of the American television shows or movies, the exportation of Americanized entertainment content is something that has been the norm. Um, and when a new show or a new sport comes out of the United States, it has instant curiosity, if not a leg up on any other content that's being pushed out into the world. So Americanized sports content growing globally. I mean, what the NBA, NBA has done has been tremendous, right? Their global growth has been massive. I think if you go to NBA, NHL, uh, NFL, and start talking about where their big horizons are in the next five years, international growth, I'm sure, is right at the top of their list. So is it for these sports. Sports is a global language. Doesn't matter what you speak from a tongue standpoint. The sport stands on its own. So really helping more sports grow globally, I think, is going to be a bigger and bigger part of our next five years. All of these have that capability. Um, and just with what happened in beach soccer and in break dancing, some of these other sports we've been involved with on a global nature, that I think is going to become a bigger and bigger part. And hopefully 95% more revenue is also going to be out there yeah. more than what we've done. So if we can grow by, you know, if we can grow, uh, 95 percent more than the current size that we are and our clients are. Obviously, that's ob that's a big deal, um, and it's possible. There's a lot of people out there; they all love sports, playing them, watching them. Just a matter of of navigating the process in the right way. How, what's the best way for people to find out more information about your company and you? Well, our website, maestro.com. That's R O E M A E S T R O E at the end. Uh, we added an E for excellence. I just made that up. Uh, that's pretty cheesy. Um, <laughs> sounds good though. It sounds good. It? I, I don't Use know. <laughs> that sounds pretty crappy when, I, when it, it, it hurt me as it came out. Um, <laughs> but in any case, uh, so, uh, you know, our website is good. We have, you know, we're on the typical social media channels. 
Um, and, uh, you know, reach out to us, me or a member of my team. We're responding to anyone that has ideas for new sports properties or has one that they want to grow quicker or faster. Um, we are always, like I said, we got 20 plus conversations going on right now. I'd love to have 40 plus conversations going on right now. You never know where the next uh, great sports business is. Um, but I will, uh, I can almost guarantee you that we have been there and done that with enough of our experience over 30 years of being in this space that every single concept or idea, um, we're going to be able to make a major difference and avoid mistakes and optimize the speed with which something can be exported and pushed out into the marketplace. Um, that I can guarantee you just because it's, we've just got so much experience in doing it. Yeah, no, it sounds exciting. And I mean, I, I've been kind of following some of the stuff that you guys have been doing and then the major league uh, rugby, they, they've been blowing up and then seeing you guys in that. And um, so I'm, I'm excited to watch your, your growth. Um, and I appreciate you joining me today and let's, let's definitely keep in touch. Yeah, my pleasure. And I uh, appreciate you spending the time with me as well.